Good morning, everybody who's joined us and welcome to this Law for Community Worker webinar, Family Law Basics. My name is Bridget Barker and I'm from the Community Legal Education Branch at Legal Aid New South Wales. I'm here with Pinar Elv from Legal Aid's statewide advice team. Good morning, Pinar. Hi, Bridget. Just before we begin the webinar, I'll um, explain how to use a control panel in Zoom in case uh, some of our audience haven't had to use Zoom before. You will have a control panel on your screen that looks like the picture at the top of this slide. Please use the Q&A box to ask any questions. Once you click on the Q&A box, it will expand like the picture that you can see on the slide and you can type your questions in there. Please type your questions in at any time and as they occur to you, but we'll answer questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, you don't need to feel shy about asking questions because you can choose to send them anonymously if you'd prefer. If for any reason we don't get to your question, um, if you're happy to um, send your question by email to us um, so we have a contact for you, then we can respond to your question uh, after the webinar has finished. So just to check that you can all hear us and so you can practice using the Q&A box, I'll ask you to please type from where you are joining us today into the Q&A box. Just while you're doing that, I'll let you know that if any of you experience trouble with sound during the webinar, you can check your sound settings by uh, expanding the audio settings that is also on your control panel on the left-hand side. Thank you. We've got people from joining us from Perth, from Dubbo, Armidale, Ride, from Riverina, WDV CAS, Sydney, St Kilda, Boonwurrung Country, Newcastle, Campbelltown, Sydney, Lake Macquarie. Thanks so much, everybody. It's always good that we um, can do that check and, and know that all the technical uh, things are working. Uh, you can also choose to see a live transcript um, by selecting show subtitle, um, and that will allow you to see subtitles during the webinar this morning. Before we begin the webinar today, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which we are broadcasting. I'm broadcasting from the lands of the Widjibal Wyabal people of the Bundjalung Nation. We pay our respects to the elders of the various lands from which we're broadcasting and from which you're joining today and um, pay our respect to their elders. Uh, past and present, and we expect, also extend that respect to other Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining the webinar today. Welcome to this Legal Aid New South Wales Law for Community Worker webinar on family law basics. My name is Bridget Barker, and I work in the Community Legal Education Branch at Legal Aid New South Wales. Today's webinar will be an hour in total, and that includes some time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar presentation. After the webinar, you will receive an evaluation survey, and we do really value your feedback, and we do try and tailor future webinar topics um, according to the feedback that we receive. I'll now introduce you to your presenter for today's webinar, Pinar Elf from Legal Aid's statewide advice team. Thank you, Pinar. Thanks, Bridget. Hi, everyone. Um, as Bridget said, my name is Pinar, uh, and I'm from the Legal Aid statewide advice team. Um, in today's webinar, we will talk about various topics, um, and in brief, we'll cover parenting after separation, child support and Centrelink payments briefly, uh, separation, divorce, property and finances. Um, there'll be a bit of information about addressing safety at court um, and at the end there'll be um, some helpful resources and links um, if, you, if you're wanting to get some further information. <clears throat> I do have a bit of a cold today so if I have a croaky throat I do apologise for that. <laughs> okay so we are going to begin by talking about divorce um sorry just need to fix my screen 
Okay. So when two people get a divorce, uh, it, it essentially means that they are no longer married um, and that their marriage has been dissolved by court. Uh, you don't have to wait to get a divorce to do a property settlement, which um, I'll talk about later. Um, and so, so basically a divorce means when a married, so a married couple is no longer married. So that's all it means. Um, property issues and, and children's matters are, are, are separate to getting a divorce. Um, there is criteria that you need to meet um, before you can apply for a divorce in New South Wales. Um, and, and that criteria is listed on the slide if you want to go to the next slide there, Bridget. Um, so the criteria is pretty straightforward. Uh, first, you need to obviously be legally married um, and you also need to be separated for 12 months before you can actually apply for a divorce. Uh, when we talk about separation, what is separation? Separation basically means that the marriage has irretrievably broken down and there is no reasonable likelihood of resumption of that, that relationship. Um, to apply for a divorce, you also have to either be an Australian citizen or regard Australia as your home and intend to live in Australia indefinitely. <clears throat> or you ordinarily live in Australia and have done so for 12 months. Um, you also have to have made some arrangements for any children under 18 when you're applying for a divorce. There is one area that people do get a little bit confused about um, and they're not sure if they can apply for a divorce and that is if they are separated but living under the one roof. So if you are separated and living under the one roof, you can still apply for a divorce, okay? Um, when you apply for a divorce in those situations, you do need to file an affidavit as well addressing the separation under the one roof. You'll need to prove that there has been a change in the marriage showing you and your spouse have separated. So um, you'd need to explain things like um, a change in sleeping arrangements in your affidavit, um, the reduction in shared activities or family outings, a decline in performing household duties for each other, um, if there is a division of finances, for example, if you've separated your bank accounts, um, and any other matter that shows that the marriage has broken down. For example, if you've notified friends and family. So if you are separated under the one roof, you will need to file an affidavit with your application addressing those matters. Okay, um, so let me just go to the next slide. Um, if you are married overseas, and a lot of people have been married overseas and, and they're living in Australia, they want to apply for a divorce, you may still be able to apply for a divorce in Australia if you or your spouse regard Australia as your home and intend to live here indefinitely, um, if you're, or if you're an Australian citizen by birth or descent um, or by a grant of Australian citizenship or if you've ordinarily lived in Australia for the last 12 months. When you're applying for a divorce, as I briefly mentioned earlier, you will need to um, give some information about um, any children under 18. So there are questions in the divorce application about children. So those questions um, relate to how much time they spend with the other parent um, and about their education, health and any financial support that the children receive. Okay, um, so talk about parenting after separation. Um, so generally when parents separate, um, it is quite a daunting time um, and usually parents want to address what will happen with their children as soon as possible before anything else. Um, often when I get clients um, wanting initial advice, their main concern is their children before anything else. Um, so when parents first go to a lawyer or if they do have to go to court or if they do their own research on family law, um, they will be told that the best interests of the children is always the paramount consideration and that parents must act in their children's best interests. Not all cases are the same and every child has different needs. So each case is always dealt with on a case by case basis under family law. The two primary considerations under family law is the need to protect the children from any harm 
And secondly, the benefit to the children of having a meaningful relationship with both parents. Um, after parents separate, if they can reach an agreement about what will happen with the children, for example, if the parents agree that um, the children will live primarily with one parent and spend time with the other parent, for example, you know, on weekends or every second weekend, um, you often see parents who are quite amicable. They might have a, an informal agreement, which might be by text message or email, or they might have a parenting plan. Um, if parents need help to resolve any parenting dispute, they are often referred to family dispute resolution, which is also called mediation. Um, there are various uh, organisations that do offer mediation services, for example. Um, there's Relationships Australia, Interrelate and Legal Aid New South Wales also provide mediation services to clients that are eligible. If parents are exempt from doing mediation and are not required to attend mediation, they may apply to the court for parenting orders. And I'll talk a little bit about um, who might be exempt from doing mediation um, uh, on the next slide. So there are certain circumstances um, which exempt a person from having to attend mediation. The main reasons include urgency, uh, for example, if a parent has been the primary carer of children and the other parent has unilaterally retained the children without the primary parent's consent, um, that primary parent may need to apply for an urgent recovery order in, in certain situations. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on recovery orders a little bit later on. Um, another situation which might exempt a person from attending mediation is if there's been abuse of a child or if there is a risk of abuse of a child um, or if there's been family violence or a risk of family violence. Um, and lastly, um, you may be exempt from attending mediation in certain situations relating to a contravention exist relating to existing parenting orders. So um, I guess the important thing is if any of these circumstances apply to a parent, um, it is important that they do get some legal advice as soon as possible. Um, if parents can successfully agree on parenting arrangements following their separation, they can record their agreement in two main ways. Firstly, they could have a parenting plan. Uh, a parenting plan is quite an informal agreement. It can be varied easily by further agreement between the parties. Um, it's not legally enforceable. Um, that's the main difference between a parenting plan and a consent order, which I'll also talk about. Um, so a parenting plan, it's not legally enforceable, but if parents ever do have to go to court in the future, a court will consider the contents of the parenting plan and what was previously agreed between the parties. So a parenting plan is, is basically a written document that must be signed and dated by both parents um, or parties. Uh, the second type of agreement uh, is called a consent order. Um, this is, is basically an application and an agreement which is registered with the court. You don't have to physically go to court for that. Um, you, you literally just need to fill out some documents, sign the documents, send it to the court, and once it's approved, it becomes legally enforceable. Um, and if the court um, approves of it, um, like I said, it's legally enforceable. It is a little bit more difficult to change. You can only change a consent order if it is agreed between the parties. If it's not agreed, then one party may need to make an application to the court to vary or change those orders. And a court may, in certain circumstances, change orders if it's satisfied that it's in the children's best interests. So I'll now talk a little bit about recovery applications, recovery order applications. Um, so who can apply for a recovery order? Um, if you're a person who the child lives with, spends time with or communicates with as stated in a parenting order, or if you're a person who has parental responsibility for a child in a parenting order, a grandparent of a child or a person who is concerned with the care, welfare and development of a child. 
for example, you may be the person who the child lives with or spends time with, but there is no parenting order that states this. So why would a person um, want to or need to apply for a recovery order? Um, there are certain situations and generally um, if one parent is the primary carer and the children live with them, if the other parent has retained the children without that primary carer's consent, that is a very common situation where a person may wish to or need to apply for a, a recovery order, particularly if there is any risk to the children. Um, when you apply for a recovery order, um, you must also file an affidavit. Um, and in that affidavit, you need to address certain uh, factors. Um, and that includes a brief history of the relationship between you and the person the child is presumed to be with, a list of previous uh, court hearings or parenting orders, details about the child and where they usually live, how and when the child was taken from you or not delivered to you, where the child might be and the basis for that belief, uh, steps, if any, that have been taken to find the child and why it's in the child's best interest to be returned to you, the likely impact on the child if a, if a recovery order is not made and any other factor that is relevant to the case. If a child is not found, a court can make uh, a location order which requires a person to give the court information about the child's location or the court could make a Commonwealth information order which requires a Commonwealth government department such as Centrelink to give the court information about the child's location that is contained in or comes into the records of, of that department. If a child has been taken out of Australia, um, it's important that you contact the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department for assistance. <clears throat> so a, a recovery order is basically an order that the court makes, as I said, that requires a person to return a child to to you. Um, a recovery order can also authorise or direct a person such as police officers to take appropriate action to find, recover and deliver a child to one of the people um, or to the person applying for the recovery order. Okay. Um, now, I've been asked to briefly uh, just touch upon separation of siblings. Um, so generally, it is in children's best interests to live together with their siblings. Uh, it is rare that a court would separate siblings, but each case, as I said earlier on, is determined on its individual facts and circumstances. To, deter to determine what is in a child's best interest, the court will always look at Section 60CC of the Family Law Act. Um, and if a party is applying to have siblings separated, the court will also look at the nature of the relationship between the siblings, the likely effect of a separation of the siblings um, and the views of the children together with their age and maturity. If a party is proposing to separate siblings, um, in most situations the court will order a family report or an expert report to address uh, factors including the effect of separating the siblings, uh, particularly the impact, the psychological impact it might have, the impact on their bond and the nature of the relationship between the siblings. Um, so a, a, an expert report is usually by either a psychologist or a psychiatrist and is usually much more expensive um, than a family report. Generally, parties don't uh, pay for a family report that's done by a family consultant from the court. Um, so if we quickly have a look a bit at child support and Centrelink payments, um, I won't go into too much detail about this, um, but child support is uh, money that is paid by one parent to the other parent for the care of a child, um, and child support is administered through the Child Support Agency or Services Australia. You can apply for a child support assessment by going onto the Services Australia website, and the link is there in the slide. Uh, when parties separate, they may also be entitled to Centrelink payments, including pensions and allowances, uh, family tax benefit um, and childcare fee assistance. 
Um, so I'll now go on to talk about property and finance. Um, there are important time limits that need to be um, considered with respect to property and financial matters, depending on whether couples are married or in a de facto relationship. So if you are married, applications for property adjustment or maintenance must be made within 12 months of when the party's divorce becomes final. If you were in a de facto relationship, your application for property adjustment must be made within two years of the breakdown of the de facto relationship. Sometimes we do get people um, who come to the statewide advice team for advice um, and they weren't uh, aware of the time limit and they're out of time, um, but we would generally um, give them some general advice and say that, um, look, a, a court can still uh, allow you to apply out of time, particularly if you can show that there would be hardship to you um, or to a child of the relationship. Um, so what is property? Um, property can include various things. There are a list of different types of property um, that can be included in a property adjustment in the slides. Um, and that can include, for example, houses, businesses, cars, motorbikes, caravans, shares, pets, furniture and cash. Um, under family law, superannuation is also treated as property and can be split between parties. Um, so sometimes we might get a client who needs advice about property and the only property that might actually exist is superannuation. They might not have any other property. So um, in those situations, we obviously indicate that, yes, they can still apply for a, a, a superannuation splitting order. Uh, but as I will talk uh touch on later, there are certain pre-action procedures that um, they need to comply with before applying to the court. Um, so you can certainly settle property matters out of court without um, actually having to go to court. And I will talk about that um, very shortly. Um, so debt um, can include mortgages, personal loans, car loans, credit cards, unpaid um, taxes and household bills. Um, so not only can property be uh, divided between parties, but the court can actually uh, uh, split debt between parties as well. And, and there might be certain situations where there's actually no property and it's just debt that, that people have um, and that they need to um, divide between them. So um before a person can apply to the court for orders about property, they must do certain things as part of their pre-action procedure. Uh, this includes taking genuine steps to resolve the issue out of court and attending dispute resolution. If dispute resolution is unsuccessful, the parties must write to the other, setting out their claim and exploring options for settlement. The objectives of pre-action procedure uh, are to encourage early and full disclosure through the exchange of information and documents about relevant issues. So generally, you parties would need to exchange a number of documents, including pay slips, tax returns, um, bank statements, um, superannuation statements, and, and other information about any other um, asset or debt that they may have in their name. Um, the other objective of pre-action procedure is to help people resolve their difference quickly, differences quickly and fairly and to avoid any legal action where possible. And this will no doubt limit costs and hopefully avoid the need to start court proceedings. Uh, the next slide is just a little mind map of how parties can obtain an agreement or court orders about property. Um, you will see that there are certain situations um, where a person might be exempt from doing dispute resolution in property cases, um, and that includes if there are allegations of family violence or a risk of family violence. Um, for applications that are urgent, for example, 
a person may need to apply for an urgent injunction, which is a restraint against the other party from disposing of property. Uh, if the applicant would be unduly prejudiced, if required to comply with pre-action procedure, that is another situation where they may be exempt from doing dispute resolution. Uh, or if a previous family law application has already been filed within the last 12 months. Um, in terms of recording an agreement about property or finances, um, let's just say the parties have reached an agreement between themselves or if they have gone to family dispute resolution and they've reached an agreement at dispute resolution, there are generally two ways that an agreement can be recorded regarding property or finances. The first is called consent orders and the second is a binding financial agreement. Um, to, so the, the slide explains the difference between the two, but the main difference is that a consent order is an order of a court, whereas a binding financial agreement is not. To obtain consent orders, parties must file an application for consent orders together with their agreement. And once approved by the court, it becomes a le legally enforceable court order. A binding financial agreement, um, it, it requires a private solicitor to prepare. Um, both parties do need to get independent legal advice and it's enforced as a contract between the parties and binding financial agreements tend to be quite expensive as well, much more expensive than a consent order. Well, that's my experience. Um, so when we're talking about property and finances, um, there are four main steps that are, uh, are taken to determine what a party may be entitled to. The first step is to identify the value of the assets and liabilities of the parties. This step may require a valuation on a home or a business valuation. If either party has a business or if there's a house, there, there would need to be either a market appraisal or a, a proper valuation on the house. The second step is to assess each of the party's contributions. And this includes looking at each party's earnings during the relationship. Um, the savings, gifts, inheritances or property owned before the relationship, um, improvements to property and contributions as a homemaker, for example, doing housework and as a parent looking after children. So they are very important contributions that are looked at under family law as well. Step three. Um, involves considering any other important and relevant factor to determine the future needs of each person, including but not limited to how much each person is currently earning um, and could earn in the future, um, the age and health of each person, the care and financial support of children, the responsibility for looking after other people, uh, the length of the relationship, and the current eligibility of a pension allowance benefit or Centrelink payment or superannuation of the parties. So that uh, is what is considered when determining each party's future needs. Um, the last step is uh, working out what is just and fair for each person considering all of the facts and circumstances of the case. Uh, so the law doesn't look at who left the relationship or why. And regardless of whether you settle out of court or go to court, the aim is to make sure that um, any agreement or division of assets and liabilities is just and fair and meet the future needs of, of each person. Um, so I'll quickly talk about maintenance. Um, so... Maintenance is paying money to support another person. Uh, for example, this may be spousal maintenance to support an ex-partner. Under the Family Law Act, you can seek maintenance if you are unable to support yourself from your own resources and your partner has the capacity to pay maintenance to you. A person may be able to receive maintenance where they cannot meet their own reasonable expenses from their own personal income or assets because they are caring for a child of the relationship or if they 
can't work due to health, disability or age, or if they no longer have the necessary skills to gain employment, or if they're unable to support themselves due to other good reasons. Um, when a person is applying for maintenance, um, the other person um, must have the capacity to pay maintenance before a court would order that person to pay maintenance. Um, so the court will consider the other person's ability to pay maintenance when determining how much maintenance you may receive. Um, and if maintenance is, is, if a court does make an order for maintenance, that entitlement may cease if you marry or enter into another de facto relationship. Uh, when determining whether a party should pay maintenance, the court will consider a number of things, including um, the party's age and their health, their income, property and financial resources, their ability to work, what is, suitable, what is a suitable standard of living, um, and if the marriage has affected or the relationship has affected their ability to earn an income. The court also takes into account with whom the children under 18 live. Um, so sometimes when people go to court, um, whether it's in relation to children or property, um, they might have some safety uh, concerns. Um, so if a person has immediate safety concerns about their safety or, or their children, they should contact the police. Um, they should also get some legal advice. If you do have to go to court, um, be rest assured that the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia takes family and domestic violence very seriously. There are safe rooms available in many registries and sometimes separate entry and exit points that can be used. Um, and if the judge allows, there may be attendance by phone or video um, in certain situations. So the next few slides uh, just detail some helpful resources and links that might be of interest um, where you can get some further information about um, family uh, law matters relating to children and property. Um, so that's essentially the end of the webinar. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Uh, hopefully I didn't talk too fast there. <laughs> Thanks so much, Pina. Um, I'll just leave the first resource slide up for now. And just to let people know, I have uploaded the handout again into the chat. I think sometimes if somebody joins after I've uploaded, they won't be able to see it. So I've uploaded again and hopefully um, you'll be able to access a copy of the handout there. But I will also send it as an attachment via email to um, our participants following the webinar today. Um, and I apologise that I, at one point I was lagging a bit in moving the slides. So um, you may have experienced um, trouble uh, reading some of the slides and I'll make sure that a copy of the handout is sent to you all. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that have come through. Mm -hmm. The first one is, does this mean that the court doesn't consider domestic and family violence in property and assets settlement? No, no. Certainly the court does consider um, family and domestic violence in, in property matters as well. So that is one of the considerations under the Family Law Act. Um, so if if a person is alleging um, that there has been uh, family and domestic violence, firstly, whenever a person um, files an initiating application in court, they do have an obligation to provide a copy of any prior uh, domestic violence orders. Um, even if there was no domestic violence order and there was still family domestic violence in the relationship, um, that information can be provided to the court through the party's affidavit. So they will generally be required to detail what the domestic, family domestic violence was. Um, and certainly um, the court will consider that when, when looking at um, a property division um, so does that answer uh, your question? 
Perhaps, Tori, if you could just let us know if, if there was anything else in relation to that that you'd like to um, pin on to expand on. Um, there's a question from Jennifer. In determining asset division, do they take into – oh, sorry, it's the same question. Do they take into consideration domestic violence and the need to leave? Yes, certainly. Um, and and I guess without having more information um, – it, so in Australia, it is a no-fault fault divorce system. Um, but if there is a situation where a person needs to leave the relationship due to family and domestic violence or safety issues, that is, is certainly considered. And depending on the type of application they are making, for example, um, like I said, without further knowing further information, if the person's applying for exclusive use an occupancy of the former matrimonial home, um, then certainly that would be a consideration um, if the person had to, to leave because of family domestic violence. But to, to generally answer the question, yes, um, that, that would be considered by the court. Thank you. There's a question about child support. How is the amount of child support to be paid determined? Okay. So, um, that's not something that I can um, answer. Um, I, if if you need me to, I can provide further information um, by email if you want to send the question to the CLE team. But generally the amount of money that is um, calculated um, is determined by the Child Support Agency um, Services New South Wales. So there would they would look at the other person's income and assets and also um, the person applying for child support, the, the, the agency will look at their income as well. Um, and there is a formula that they use. So I, I won't be able to give you the formula um, right now. So it's something that the child support agency actually determines. So um, like I said, and if, you, if you need further information, I'm happy to email that. Also, just to let our audience know, we actually have um, a specialist uh, child support service within Legal Aid and I have scheduled a webinar with them um, and that's uh, scheduled for the 14th of November, a bit later this year. So we will be running a webinar in November um, called Child Support Essentials. So um, you'll be able to register for that um, We've already set that up. So the next time the alert comes out, um, you should be able to register for that for that webinar and um, uh, the presenter of that webinar will be able to answer more detailed questions in relation to child support because that's a, their area of expertise. Um, a question from Carolyn, uh, can a person receive spousal maintenance and child support? Yes. Um, when a person is applying for um, spousal maintenance, um, the court will look at whether they are receiving child support, um, for example, through um, Services Australia. Um, that is one of the considerations that the court will look at. So if they're receiving child support, but the court can still make an order for spousal maintenance. So spousal maintenance is obviously something that is ordered through the court. Child support is, is through um, the child support agency. Um, so even if you are receiving child support, yes, a court can make an order for spousal maintenance, but when determining whether spousal maintenance should be paid and if so, how much, the court will consider um, how much child support the person is also receiving. Thank you. Um, Tori has a question. Is financial abuse considered within domestic and family violence? Yes, it is, certainly. Um, so financial abuse is something um, that we see quite often. Um, it is a very common form of abuse, um, even if there's no other abuse, if it's just financial, um, that is definitely um, considered under the family law legislation. Thank you. Um, another question from a participant. Can a child live with a non-custodial parent without going back to court if all the parties are in agreement? I guess um, it depends on if there's 
if there are current uh, orders in place. So um, I guess generally to answer the question, yes, um, that that could happen if all of the parties agree. Um, if there are current orders in place um, and if they are wanting to have the child live with a non-custodial parent, then it's best to get legal advice um, because if a parent's not complying with a court order, they could potentially be in breach of that order. So it may be necessary to change those orders, whether by agreement or going back to court. Uh, but if there are no court orders in place, um, then, then yes, you can agree for a non-custodial parent to, to care for a child if it's agreed to by all of the parents. Um, but it would be a situation where perhaps um, the, the parents should get legal advice about that. Thank you. There's just a question about the hand aid, handout. Um, chat is disabled in our version of Zoom um, in terms of preventing people from um, asking questions via the chat, but I understood that you should be able to access the handout when I uploaded it into the chat box. Um, however, I always send a copy of the materials by email following the webinar. So if you aren't able to access and download the material um, via the chat box while we're live, um, don't worry because I will send it um, after the webinar today um, as an attachment in an email. So um, I'll just use the email addresses that people um, registered with and I'll send a copy of that out as well. And also um, in the email that you will receive um, following today's webinar, I think it comes out a day after the webinar um, in the automated system. Uh, I'll include all the links um, that are in Pinar's slides um, so that, that you can follow those links directly from your webinar and access the information. Uh, a question, what does the early intervention unit do? Uh, so the early intervention unit, um, they generally are at um, the registries of the court. Um, if a person needs um, advice, if, if a person has a court matter on um, on that day and they don't have a lawyer and they need legal advice um, or duty services, sometimes the early intervention unit can assist them. Um, also, if there is an urgent matter where, for example, if there needs to be an urgent recovery order, um, sometimes the early intervention unit can assist um, certain people in, in those situations. Thank you, Pina. At the moment, they're all the questions that we have. If anyone else has any more questions, we've still got a little bit of time left that we scheduled for the webinar. If you haven't, then um, you, you can please feel free to send any questions that might occur to you after the webinar today. Um, you're welcome to send them to this email address on the slide that I've just changed to now, cle at legalaid.nsw.gov.au. So, yeah, if anything occurs to you after the webinar today, then feel free to um, uh, feel free to ask. Um, somebody's just trying. Uh, Tori's just trying to clarify. So, the early intervention unit is not for general non-urgent advice. Uh, generally, not. Um, if a party needs legal advice. Um, what I could potentially recommend is that you call Law Access um, and make an appointment um, for some legal advice from the statewide advice team of Legal Aid um, and you can um, get some legal advice generally within a couple of weeks. Um, so if it's non-urgent, um, then I would encourage um, you to call Law Access and make an appointment um, we give advices every day to people over the phone for non-urgent matters. 
Um, so lower access would be a good start. Uh, Pina, we've received another question, but it seems a little uh, specific to someone's particular situation. Um, the person has sent it anonymously. If if you are comfortable to um, email us uh, the question so that we have a contact for you, then um, we can uh, connect you with somebody who can provide you with advice um, or if it's somebody that you're assisting, um, then it's probably better to get more detail and to provide um, an answer to that question offline um, so that the advice can be tailored to the particular situation. So if there's not any further questions, um, sorry, there's one more question just come in. What, what, which is the best location to send clients experiencing domestic violence for legal advice? Um, to FAS, uh, DB Legal Aid and Law Access. Uh, I think they're wondering what the best service is for clients experiencing domestic and family violence. Um, so Legal Aid obviously do have a domestic violence unit um, who specialise in domestic and family violence cases um, who can provide advice. Um, so that, that obviously the, the domestic violence unit would probably be um, the best uh, option to, to get some legal advice. Um, if the person comes through law access and then to the statewide advice team um, and when we're talking to the person, if it's clear that they are experiencing family and domestic violence, we can also refer them off to the domestic violence unit um, and we might be able to send them an email, send, send details or contact details to the domestic violence unit to get into get in contact with that person to give them legal advice if we assess that the domestic violence unit is more appropriate to be giving advice. We've still got a little bit more time if there are any quest last questions that have occurred to anybody. If not, just to let, just to repeat that I will send the handout by email and I'll also include in the email that you receive via our Zoom uh, webinar software, the links to resources um, that are included in the handout as well, so that you'll be able to um, link through to those directly from the email. And uh, just to say a big thank you to you, Pinar, for providing the information in the webinar today um, and thank also to our audience for joining us um, and as I said um, any feedback that you have um, we do take on boards um, and suggestions for other topics that you'd like to receive information about um, please feel free to include that in the, the, the evaluation survey. Well thank you Bridget. Thanks, everybody. We'll close the webinar now. Thanks. Enjoy Bye -bye. the rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.